Hello, everyone. Welcome back um, to our weekly webinar. I'm so excited to be here. Um, my name is Medina. For those of you who don't know me, um, I am a therapist at NoCD, and um, I'm super excited to have Shala, am I saying that right still, yeah. <laughs> um, with us tonight. I'm actually going to just wait a few minutes or a few seconds to just let some people come in before I introduce her. Um, but just a reminder, um, NoCD is a downloadable app, so um, you can download it in um, the App Store, Google Play, um, and it is free. Lots of cool resources on there. Um, so if you are not linked with our app, make sure you check it out. Um, and as always, if you ever are interested in treatment at NoCD, you can visit treatmyocd.com. Okay, cool. Um, so let's introduce Shala. So Shala um, LPC is an author of Is Fred in the Refrigerator? Taming OCD and Reclaiming My Life and co-author with John Hirschfield of Everyday Mindfulness for OCD, Tips, Tricks, and Skills for Living Joyfully. She is a counselor and a cognitive behavioral therapist in the metro Atlanta, in Metro Atlanta, Georgia, specializing in the treatment of OCD and related disorders and anxiety disorder disorders. Shala pro produces the Shoulders Back tips and resources for taming OCD newsletter and blogs for Psychology Today, offering an inside perspective on life with OCD. She is currently working on her third book a murder mystery called A Day to Die about the true price of, of secrets we keep from ourselves. So, wow, that is such a cool bio. We're definitely going to get into some of your guys' questions, but I would love to hear more from um, Shala, like anything about the books or any anything that you want to share with, with people on the call right now. Well, thanks, Medina. I'm just very honored to be here. Um, and I wish Dr. McGrath could be with us here today, but I know he had a travel thing happen all of a sudden, so can't be with us. Um, but I just want to thank you for being here and just, I guess, open it up for questions, anything that we can answer. Okay, cool. So I will start right at the top. We already have some cool questions coming in. Okay. So can OCD make you imagine something on purpose because I imagine something and I don't know what intention with what intentions I did it. So yeah, this is this is a really interesting question. Um, you know, a lot of times I know for so many of my members, um, they are thinking about things for the exact reason because they so badly don't want to be thinking about those things. Um, and then it typically is followed with, you know, what does it mean that I thought um, that particular thought or or thing that popped into my head? Um, and I really I really like to go off this acceptance piece as far as um, accepting that we as humans are going to be having thoughts and feelings um, that we don't particularly like. Um, and really accepting that versus trying to figure out why we're we're having something pop into our head or an image or or whatever it is that um, is kind of popping into your head. I don't know what your thoughts are. Oops, let me go back. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the things that we can get trapped in as people with OCD, because as well as treating OCD, I have OCD, is getting stuck in, is this my OCD? And gosh, if it's not my OCD, this is really bad. So is this my OCD? So trying to figure out, is it my OCD making me imagine this? Or is mm -hmm. this me imagining this? And if it's me imagining this, this would be bad. And I think that gets into a whole compulsive cycle too. Mm -hmm. So again, just following up on what Medina said, it's accepting that we all have these intrusive thoughts. And it's the OCD reaction to the intrusive thoughts that's the problem and really learning to live with the uncertainty of I'm not quite sure why I thought that and maybe it's me and maybe it's my OCD and really using exposure therapy to learn to live with that uncertainty. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah and I think um, I don't know if you find that this is really common but really attaching like, what it means as for you as a person like I must be an awful person for thinking that thought, or um, I must be so bad for having that thought, which can follow, be followed by a lot of feelings around guilt and shame. Yes, and there's a great book called Imp of the Mind where Lee Bear talks about some of the research on what kind of thoughts people have. Mm -hmm. And if I'm remembering correctly, what he shared was that the majority of people have the exact same intrusive thoughts that 
people with OCD have. They just don't react to them in the same way that those of us with OCD might react. They might say, oh, that was weird. Or they might not even notice it. It goes in and out so fast. So when OCD tells you, gosh, you should be ashamed for having this thought, again, that's part of the OCD cycle. That's how it's keeping you stuck. Everybody has those thoughts. It's, again, the reaction to the thoughts that makes the thoughts keep coming back. Right, right. So uh, maybe less trying to figure out with what intentions and more acceptance around some of these thoughts. Okay. Um, this has got a couple parts to it, this question. Um, I'll, re I'll keep reading after this, but I have harm OCD and doing ERP, I don't really know what my triggers are. The thoughts seem to be random more than triggered. Could I just think about the, the thoughts I have of harming my family? to make me anxious and work on ERP in that way. So let, let's address um, that piece of it first. Do you wanna start off, Shala? Sure, so I think that the really the ideal way to do ERP is to find the triggers that you can create in real life and do that. You can certainly just think the thoughts, but I think it's more powerful mm -hmm. to go be around that family member that the OCD says you're going to harm. So if you can keep a list, for instance, as the triggers are coming up, as they do bother you and just jot them down, that's how you can get a good list to then go back and say, okay, I'm gonna go on purpose and go make these things happen. I'm gonna trigger the OCD instead of the OCD triggering me and then let those thoughts be there. That's actually more powerful because that's doing what we call in vivo exposure. So in life, as well as letting the thoughts be there, which can be more imaginal exposure. And the combination together is much more powerful than just the imaginal or just letting the thoughts be there on their own. Yeah, and I, I find it's really common that a lot of times people will think that they don't have any triggers, but when we really sit down, like there typically is a ton of triggers. Um, so just asking yourself like simple questions, like what exactly was going on before, um, you know, I felt really anxious or before, um, you know, maybe I had to leave the room away from my family. Um, so, so taking maybe a more constructive look at some of that stuff, like, uh, like Shala had said, maybe bringing a piece of paper and jotting down some things that are going on. Um, and I also think that for me, I'm not so much concerned with exposing my members just because you guys are exposed to scary things pretty much probably every day, whether you want to be exposed or not, there might be some avoidance going on, but I'm, I'm really, really working on like the response prevention piece, um, you know, working on resisting some of those compulsions. Um, Cause I think the exposures by nature are going to be coming things that are scary will, will inevitably tend to pop up. Um, and so that's the other part of the question, thinking about, making me anxious and work on ERP in that way, um, which we kind of just touched on. Thinking about hurting someone triggers me, so could I do that as a trigger to practice ERP? Yeah, so I, I would imagine that just being around people in general um, can be a trigger. Um, I think also to a common, common fear with this theme I often see is a fear of kind of going crazy um, so some triggers around that too, um, just even over evaluation of body sensations and, you know, what if I just snap and I, and I go crazy and I hurt someone? Um, I don't know if any of that is resonate, resonating with you, but also maybe some areas to look at. Um, and then a third part to the question. Um, Sorry for the for another question, but I was wondering if meditation is okay when going through no CDs therapy and ERP. Um, so I know at no CD, I don't know what what you do at your practice, Shala, but um, we we typically encourage away from any sort of relaxation, really, because um, it gets in the way of of that learning moment of that you of you being able to handle um, the distress without having some sort of safety mechanism or safety behavior. Um, it's not to say that meditation is bad, um, but we don't want to do it in efforts to escape something that's scary. And could I add a little bit onto that? Yeah, yeah. I love so to hear. I think it, it comes down to your intentions for the meditation. Like mm -hmm. Medina said, if you're using it to try to relax or distract or that kind of thing, definitely don't want to do that. 
you can learn to do it to be more mindfully aware of what's happening in, in your brain. And that's actually a really good thing to do because if you think about exposure therapy, it's really a type of mindfulness because we're asking you to be really focused on this scary thought or trigger that's in front of you. And if you learn how to do meditation, so that you're getting better at being able to be present with what's in front of you, even though it's scary, or get better at being aware of, gosh, that's my OCD reacting to an intrusive thought, that can actually be really helpful. And that's a lot of what um, the book that John Hirschfeld and I co-wrote, Everyday Mindfulness for OCD, is about, is talking about the appropriate use of meditation um, as part of ERP. So that might be a resource for you um, for that. Yeah. And I, I'm just curious, Shala, I think I've seen a lot of meditation kind of, or not even meditation, but mindfulness kind of be skewed to be this relaxation technique when really, if we look at it, it's not so much that's kind of what you're speaking on as far as being attentive or aware of what's currently going on, even though it might not feel comfortable. Um, so I don't know if, if you kind of noticed that with some of some of your clients that they they might have a skewed view of what mindfulness is. Yeah, because I think there's a skewed view of meditation as being I need to clear my mind mm -hmm. and be in this zen relaxed state. And that's not what meditation is about at all. It's really about noticing when your mind wanders, which honestly can be every second, every mm -hmm. nanosecond. <laughs> I know when I do this, it's really hard to stay focused and then bringing it back and the process of recognizing that your mind has wandered and bringing it back. That's mindfulness. And so every time that you do that and bring it back, that's a moment of mindfulness. And you can meditate for 10 minutes and have hundreds of moments of mindfulness in there. And your brain could be a buzz with things, but still you're noticing and you're bringing it back. So that's really what mindfulness is. And meditation is just the practice of learning how to do that better. There may be some types of meditation that are about being relaxed. That's not generally how I see mindfulness meditation, because again, that's just being mindful of what's here. And if you have OCD, what's here a lot of times is intrusive thoughts and anxiety. And so mm -hmm. it's really learning how to become accepting of those and to not interact with the thoughts compulsively. And this can definitely help with all of that. Yeah, cool, amazing. Well, hopefully that's helpful, Ian. Okay. Um, I'm settling on a new home tomorrow. I'm excited and anxious. OCD is trying to convince me that I'm not excited. Um, I'm scared that OCD will ruin what should be a happy day. Any advice? Yeah, so I guess my, my first inclination is I'm not sure if worrying if tomorrow will be exciting or not is the best way to figure that out. And, I, and it's exactly OCD's way of trying to steal that joy that... Um, you want to be having tomorrow um, and, you know, redirecting, I think, to the moment, kind of the mindfulness that we were kind of touching on just now um, and recognizing that tomorrow, whatever does wind up happening, because tomorrow may be stressful. I mean, moving is a stressful adjustment and, and a stressful um, transition. So, but trusting that whatever tomorrow brings that you will be able to manage and deal with that as it comes versus trying to figure out um, what tomorrow will consist of. Um. And to go along with that, um, first, congratulations. That's really exciting. And I can see why you want to be excited about that. And also, it's totally normal for OCD to come in and kill the things that you're excited about, right? No, you can't be excited about this. And if you think about what the essence of good exposure is, it's acting like what OCD is saying is irrelevant. And so if you go into tomorrow acting like your OCD's worries don't matter, then you go into tomorrow acting happy because that's how you would be if OCD weren't bothering you about this. Mm -hmm. And so that's the essence of ex exposure about this is being able to have those OCD worries with you and maybe even feel anxious because of OCD, but saying, hey, I'm really happy about this. So I'm going to do the best I can to be happy about this, to act happy about this, because that, again, is acting like OCD's content doesn't matter. And there's a blog I wrote a couple of years ago on Psychology Today called The Subtle 
um, OCD compulsion you might not know you're doing about how those of us with OCD can use emotions as compulsions. Um, and people do this a lot with depression where they hear the, the intrusive thoughts, they hear the OCD's reactions to those thoughts, and then they think, oh my gosh, those thoughts are true. And if those thoughts are true, boy, this means my life is over and then I'm gonna be depressed. And then they start going through life as if those thoughts were true, as if they'd run somebody over, stabbed their loved one, or were a pedophile, or sexually molesting people or whatever it is and then they they start really deflating and acting like everything's horrible and everything's depressed and that acting like you're depressed becomes part of the compulsion and so part of doing the exposure for that is you know what i call putting your shoulders back and acting again like there's joy in your life like finding that joy and growing it um, because again, that's acting like what OCD is saying is irrelevant. So if that blog post would be helpful to you, you might check that out before tomorrow. But I would say, you know, this is a happy day and you just act as happy as you can, even as you feel anxious. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Even though anxiety and OCD wants you to doubt, you still fully engage um, in, in the move as, and, and enjoy as best as you can. Well, Shala's got all the cool book recommendations. I love it. <laughs> Okay. I get anxious whenever I get a thought in which I might disrespect a higher being or go against a certain religion. I have to walk in and out of a room or something bad might happen to me. Um, okay. That's the only part of the question. Um, so certainly sounds distressing. I don't know if you want to, if you want to start talking about it, Shala. Well, sure. I know that the ICDF is having a free conference on Friday about faith and OCD. So that may be something you want to check out and attend. It's from one to five Eastern time on Friday and it's online. So that might be a good place to learn more about this topic. Um, you know, without knowing exactly what the question is here, um, not sure what more to say. I'll hand it back to Medina. Yeah. Um, great, great uh, resource that hopefully you can check out, Steve. Um, okay. Mm. Okay. I've heard a lot of people with that, people that have, I guess, OCD intrusive thoughts go against a person's values, but I often find myself questioning what my values truly are. Um, is this normal? Um, so questioning, I, I don't doubt someone who has OCD is questioning a lot. Um, I know that we refer to it as the doubting disorder. So no matter what um, kind of happens, um, the person with OCD tends to doubt. Like I'll see it even, I think OCD has a lot of tricks up its sleeve. Like when I start to treat a member and they start to get better, they start to doubt that they're getting better um, and things of that nature. So um I want to. I definitely want to normalize it for you um, that it is it is common to question a lot of things, including your values. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if if that you want to expand or you want to move on. Okay, uh, let's see. Lots of good questions. Another is this common question? So if POCD. And it often makes me feel like I'm on the verge of doing something terrible, even though I have never harmed anyone in my life. Is this common? Um, I don't know. I, I'm curious, Shal, what's your what's your view on the word like common or? Uh, yeah, I think that. You know, probably, you know, what this question is asking is, you know, gosh, am I crazy here? Like, yeah, I have, you know, and I think the answer is, no, you're not crazy. You have OCD. And if you have OCD and you have POCD, yes, what you're describing is absolutely common. Um, so I think it's really important to be compassionate with yourself because OCD is going to tell you this is not common. You are the only one and you're mm -hmm. bad. Um, and that's how it's keeping you stuck and isolated and feeling defeated and really recognizing that you're not alone. There are lots of people out there with POCD and almost everybody with this form of OCD feels like they're on the verge of doing something terrible. So just remember, you're not alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a really good point. Um, I can't remember what podcast specifically it was. It was the OCD stories, but I can't remember which um, episode it was, but talked about um, POCD specifically and how there's a lot of um, kind of self-punishment 
especially with this um, subtype and almost living like kind of how you touched on earlier, Shala, as if you were a pedophile, like, um, you know, maybe not letting yourself see your friends or loved ones or, or younger family members and things like that. So yes, de definitely giving yourself some grace in, in working through this stuff. Um, and even that word feeling, right? I feel like I'm on the verge of doing something terrible. We can we can totally validate that feeling and that must feel so scary. And as you've mentioned, terrible. Um, but we also have to recognize that because you feel that way doesn't necessarily mean it will equate to action, that you will actually do something terrible. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Trying to read fast. Uh, okay. What causes thought action fusion and how do you treat it? So um, anyone who doesn't know thought action fusion, I kind of describe it as this belief that if we think, feel, or say something, then it must mean it's true, um, which you will commonly see with, with people who have OCD. Um, and I personally like to treat it by behavioral approaches. So physically showing the person that just because you think, feel, or say something doesn't equate to action, kind of how we, we were just touching on the last question. Um, so, you know, if I, if I did fear that I was a pedophile, I, I might write it down. There's a chance I'm a pedophile, or even I could go as far to write, I am a pedophile um, and show myself that just because I am writing it down doesn't actually mean that I am now all of a sudden a pedophile. Um, I don't know. Did, did you want to touch on it at all? Or, you know, the only thing sometimes I will use with this as an example is we think this only works when the thoughts are negative. Mm. Um, and, you know, if I sit here and think, I want a million dollars, I want a million dollars, like there's no million dollars around me. <laughs> That'd be great. Like, that's just an example of yeah. how, you know, we totally discount the positive thoughts. Well, of course, that's not going to happen, right? But then we have the negative thoughts. Well, of course, that is going to happen. And just mm -hmm. I use that as an example of now, wait a minute, <laughs> how can it work one way over here and not the other way over here? Um, just to sort of show the process of what's happening with thought action fusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's really funny that you bring that up because I will always joke to my members like, "Can you, I will expect that if you speak me into being a millionaire, I will now wake up with a ton of money," um, <laughs> and just bringing a little bit of humor to that too. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. How do you break the vicious cycle of being tired of fighting OCD and then getting scared that the exhaustion will lead to you acting on your fears? Good one. That does sound very tiring and vicious is, I guess, a good good way to describe it, I'm sure. Um, do you want to start with this one, Shala? Sure. So I think, first off, just recognizing, yeah, having OCD is exhausting, fighting OCD is exhausting. So first giving yourself a break that you're exhausted. Everybody who is in OC ther OCD therapy and working on this is exhausted. And OCD often will take parts of your therapy and wrap them into its obsessions to try to knock you off your game. Mm -hmm. And so it can come in here and say, gosh, look, you're so exhausted because you're doing all this ERP. Maybe we should stop doing ERP so we won't be as exhausted. But really what it wants you to do is it wants you to stop doing ERP so it can get back on top again. And mm -hmm. so recognizing those little tricks, because, you know, Diana mentioned it likes to have lots of tricks up its sleeve. This could be one of them. And so this may be accepting that, yeah, maybe because I'm exhausted, you know, I'm, maybe I'm going to do this, but OCD, I'm still going to do my ERP anyway. You're not going to trick me that easily. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's such a clear example of how it's never satisfied. Like we could go as far to, again, bring a little bit of humor. Just, does every person that's exhausted start doing all these wild, crazy things? Is that, are those the prerequisites to doing, you know, fearful things? Um, and yeah, I, I think, you know, bringing, bringing some of that humor there might be really important. There was something else I was going to say, but I, I won't pretend I, I lost my train of thought. So, um, the vicious cycle of fitting. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm remembering. Um, 
Yeah, I think, you know, this idea of OCD trying so relentlessly hard to prevent you from getting better. Um, you know, I'll see this a lot of times when people are feeling good, like, hey, Medina, I don't want to practice my ERP, like I'm having a really good day. Um, and like Shala said, it's really just OCD's way of saying, like, don't practice your ERP. And again, I will point out the holes in the logic. They're like, Oh, well, that's interesting. I, I'm sure you've had lots of horrible days before you and I even met and you even knew about ERP. Am I guessing that correctly? Um, and, and usually they'll laugh, right? Like, yes, I've had bad days. But again, OCD is saying, well, you can't do ERP. That's just going to ruin your mood. Um, so I think, you know, not, let, not letting OCD dictate those behaviors that it wants to so badly. Mm, oh, boy. Right. Accidentally scrolled all the way to the bottom. Let me scroll back up. <laughs> How would ERP therapy be done during this pandemic? Um, so I'm going to guess that the question is maybe around like contamination concerns. Um, so typically my rule of thumb is following the CDC guidelines. Um, I don't know if you follow anything or other. Same thing. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, I think, again, a lot of times OCD will want to come in and justify, but Medina, it's a pandemic. And like, you know, what if this? And, um, you know, has a lot of cunning arguments. Um, but CD, I'm always just like, CDC. So, and yes, there's still a risk, even if we follow the CDC guidelines, because life is full of risks. So, And the CDC guidelines can change, too. Yes. It's been happening recently. And that can sort of throw OCD for a loop. But we're just doing the best we can to follow what we know at the time. And it may or may not be the exact right thing to do. But it's certainly better than following OCD. And it's what other people who don't have OCD would be doing. Okay. Um, I don't think this is really a question, but I think you would appreciate this one. Do you, I, I would love to hear what's the, what's the little guy on my shoulder idea? Sure. So I have found that personification is a really useful tool um, in managing my own OCD because if I think my OCD is me, it's really much harder to fight it. But if I think of OCD as separate, something separate, then I have some distance from it to be able to do something different than what it wants. So mm -hmm. the way that I personify my OCD is, is this little, really it's a dog toy. It's an orange ball <laughs> with big feet and sunglasses. Um, and I taped a tissue to it because my OCD cries a lot. And um, and it also has knitting. So it has a little, like it's knitting a little blue scarf, has little blue knitting needles. And when my OCD isn't bothering me, it's sort of sitting on the floor with its little knitting needles. I can hear them flicking away. And sometimes when it gets upset, though, it starts crying, which is why it has a Kleenex. And it'll crawl up onto my shoulder and start talking to me and whining and pulling up my shirt and crying because it's so scared. And it helps me to think of it like that because it can help me have a different relationship with it. When I see it as a little orange ball, I sort of see it as this annoying thing that's actually trying to be helpful, but is really misguided. And I almost have self-compassion for it and myself. I do have another personification of my OCD that I call the triad of hell, which is where when it really gets upset, it morphs into this thing that's a combination of a Dementor from Harry Potter, a Tasmanian devil from Bugs, Bugs Bunny, and the Gollum from Lord and the Rings. So it was this really big, awful monster that's whining about these things it's obsessed about and sort of whirling around looking for things that are scary. And this one needs a more aggressive stance. And when I think of it that way, I take a more aggressive stance. But sometimes mm -hmm. when I think of it like the little orange ball, I just ignore it. I'm like, yeah, that's my OCD. I'm just gonna go on with my day. So that's how I personify. And it's been a really helpful tool in, mm -hmm. in managing my OCD and having some fun with it too, because even though OCD is a very serious disorder, we don't have to take ourselves and we certainly don't have to take OCD's content seriously. And having some sort of little personification can make that easier to throw some humor in. Yeah, I love that. I mean, clearly helpful for you and sounds like for other people as well. Um, I, I think it's good too to think of it in terms of like the values. Like I'll say to my members, like, let's not let OCD decide what we're doing in the day. Let's let, you know, insert name 
decide based off what what you want to do. Um, cause OCD likes to ruin a lot of those things or, or disrupt and, and make you fearful of those things. Um, so yeah, I love that little analogy, I guess we could call it. Um, okay. I have OCD about having OCD. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yes. <laughs> um, I have intrusive thoughts about having OCD forever and won't escape my own brain. So yeah, of course, that's that's a what if followed by a worst case scenario. Like that would be horrible to be, um, you know, plagued by some of these thoughts so intensely for the rest of your life. Um, I, I commonly see this fear when people start to actually feel better, like their first subtype kind of lightens up a little bit. And now it's all of a sudden like, but what if I do actually have it? And maybe I was just faking feeling better or or something kind of like, you know, in left field. Um and it sounds like you're obsessing over obsessing, which is creating this self-fulfilling prophecy that um, the very thing that you're trying to avoid, OCD is actually creating a platter for, for that fear um, and, and paving the way, essentially. And what I see with this one a lot, and I do see this one with people who are getting almost better. It's, it's not always, but I, but I think that happens because what they do is they start micromonitoring their symptoms. Like, oh my gosh, how many intrusive thoughts did I have when I woke up this morning? How anxious am I? Did I do a compulsion? Mm -hmm. And that becomes the checking behavior is you're checking yes. your own OCD symptoms. And through checking through the attention that you're putting on them, they seem bigger and actually can become bigger because that's what you're focusing on. So it's really about accepting that, yeah, if you have OCD, I mean, my view of it is I'm always going to have OCD because I'm always going to have intrusive thoughts. And sometimes my OCD is going to react to them. I can still live an amazing, joyful life and have it not bother me very much at all, but it's always going to be there. And that's OK. And really mm -hmm. being accepting of that can can help you with this and, and really reining in your own internal checking behavior and being like, oh, wait, no, I'm just, it's, I'm having a fine. I'm not going to look at how many intrusive thoughts. I'm not going to look at how anxious I am or how many compulsions I'm doing. Really working on acceptance. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, you know, accepting, accepting some of these things can be really hard, but it, it really makes me think of the inhibitory learning model, right? We're accepting some of these thoughts and feelings um, that, that we really, we really hate having. So um, okay. Mm. Okay. This is, this is something that I see pretty common. So how can hypochondria or health anxiety is often not listed in treatment for those suffering from it? Does it not fall under OCD? Oh, I really wish Dr. McGrath were here because he can, he can talk about this. I don't know if you've ever talked to him about, about this at all, but, um, <laughs> We kind of talk about how much overlap there is with like health anxiety and all the, the anxiety disorders around health and how it is very, very similar to OCD. There's like very like minuscule differences in DSM as far as like the wording, um, you know, between the disorders to distinguish. I, I think for me personally, when I see some of these health concerns come up, it really falls under kind of that somatic type of, of fear. Like, you know, why is my heart beating? You know, I... You know, I'm sweating, like, what does that mean? Like an over analysis of the body and, and something that could be wrong. Um, so I, I kind of do treat it. I use ERP with those kinds of concerns. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do. I do too. I, you know, if somebody just has health anxiety symptoms, then I would say we have health anxiety. But oftentimes there's those symptoms plus a bunch of other symptoms. And I always consider that to be under OCD. I mean, it's treated the same, however it's diagnosed, it's ERP mm -hmm. for both of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What does it look like to recover? I recovered before twice where no signs of OCD, but this current relapse seems longer because of COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to start, Sean? Yeah. So. You know, I've been in recovery, gosh, for about 11 years at this point. And I think the longer you're in recovery, the more recovery is free of a lot of OCD interference. 
But even for me, this past year, the pandemic has made it challenging. And I realized a couple months ago that all of this talk of hand washing and how many people have died every day and that that had actually reignited some subtle compulsions that I was participating in and didn't even realize it. Because really before the pandemic, I rarely washed my hands because that was sort of my ongoing exposure. And then I'm being told to wash my hands for 20 seconds all the time. And you know, it's like, oh, we have to wash our hands. And, that I think really set off some more OCD signs and symptoms for me. So I think that probably more people, and I'm sure research will tell us exactly what's happening, but what I've seen in my practice is uh, more people are struggling right now with, with relapse type symptoms because of all that's going on with the world, because the world seems more dangerous. And so I think ongoing, the prognosis for people in recovery from OCD is really great. I really do think you can live a very joyful life. But when there's something like this going on, it can make it more challenging. And just giving yourself a break that if your relapse is longer, more intense than you would normally experience, that's probably due to the pandemic and you're not alone in what you're experiencing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely giving yourself a break, validating that it's a scary, an extra scary time for for the world really. And so it makes sense why it would feel trickier for you at this time. Um, and I think of even just like the the initial question, like what does it look like to recover? I think something that I always like to, um, I guess debunk or demystify from the get-go of treatment is the goal is never that um, we're trying to get rid of these thoughts or these feelings. Um, actually, even earlier today, I had, I had one of my members come to a session. She's like, Medina, my ERP didn't work. And I said, whoa, what do you mean by your ERP didn't work? And um, she's like, well, I still felt anxious. Um, and I said, well, that's where we're creating that different relationship with, with the anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. And so recovery looks like you still have anxiety and stress and guilt, um, whatever the emotion is, and you still have thoughts that you hate having, right? Um, but you just know how to manage them better. Oh gosh, I don't know if you did you uh, listen to this podcast? Um, the hold the basketball and drop it at the same time. Rumination mm -hmm. is a compulsion. Mm -hmm. Was that a particular podcast about that? Yeah, um, Greenberg, Michael Greenberg. No, I did not hear that one. Mm -mm. Oh, that was a good one. So I think that's what this question is asking about. But you don't need to have listened to the podcast to understand, obviously. But why do why do they say hold it? You can't hold a basketball and drop it at the same time, but you can walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. Um, so I don't know if this the walk and chew bubble gum at the same time is just like a general phrase. I don't know if anyone has said that to you in the terms or the context of OCD. Um, but if if she is she or he talking about um the podcast in the podcast just like for some background for anyone who does who hasn't listened to it um you know michael greenberg kind of talks about um you know ocd you can't like stop ruminating and want to hold on to it so bad at the same time because and he uses rumination as the example um because a lot of times what happens is rumination winds up feeling productive or like problem solving and, and i want to hold on to that so badly i might be a a neglectful or a negligent person if I if I don't worry about this thing. But at the same time, I want so badly to let go of it. And, and we can't do that at the same time. Um, so I, th I think that's kind of hopefully what you're, I guess I'm not really answering the question, but <laughs> I'm explaining what, <laughs> while holding the basketball and jumping at the same time. I don't know, have you heard the other chew bubble gum at the same time? I mean, walking, um, yes, I've heard that just as a general yes. saying, but not in relationship to OCD. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm, I could talk on this, but I don't know that I'd be answering the question. I know. I think I just did the same. So um, we will move on, but hopefully the analogy of, of realizing you can't um, ruminate or do the compulsion at the same time, not want to do the compulsion. We have to make that decision. And he kind of talks about it in terms of almost, um, it's the little man on your shoulder, right? Is that mm -hmm. the analogy you used in your book, little man on your shoulder? Well, no, it's just that's yeah. my OCD. And there was one yeah. scene in the book where it was on my shoulders. So. Okay. Yeah. So um, he kind of talked about it in terms of that, like almost separating um, the OCD. So it's not something that has to control you or has to be you, but it's more so this thing that you can choose to drop. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, I 
How long does everyone obsess and do compulsions per day? Um, so it's not a one size fits all. So I see all sorts of hour increments, I guess. Um, you know, I will say that to be diagnosed with OCD has to, you know, consume at least an hour on average of your day and or cause a lot of distress or impairment in the person's life. Um, anything to add or it's a pretty straightforward question. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're asking this question because you're wondering about what you're doing and experiencing, I think that yeah. if you have OCD and you're not treated or you're at the beginning of treatment, you're going to have a lot of obsessions and a lot of compulsions. And it can feel honestly like it's all day long. And that's part of having OCD. Um, but that's why it's so great that we have ERP and companies like NoCD to help you get better because for as debilitating as OCD is, it's also really treatable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. When I first got into spirituality, I learned about manifestation and the idea that your thoughts become your re reality. It has been, it has made battling OCD harder. Any experience or thoughts on this? So, yeah, I, I know I struggle sometimes in the sense of like, gosh, like I feel like some of these things that I'm encouraging people to say, like just sound not fun. Um, and I think there's a difference between being positive um, and also recognizing that just because you say something or or you put it out into the universe doesn't mean that it has to become your reality, especially if you are struggling with OCD. I think this is it's a little bit. It can be a little bit more of a different approach in the sense, in that sense, versus maybe someone who doesn't have OCD. Um, just because we know that that's kind of the that is the type of treatment that can be really helpful is to teach you that your thoughts don't have to be your reality. And I think accepting and even saying, you know, well, I said that it may or may not become true. I may or may not be manifesting horrible things into my life. But the thing is, is these thoughts, if you have OCD, are there anyway. So when you're doing things like scripting and putting the thoughts out there, I mean, they're out there anyway, because these are the intrusive sure. thoughts you're having, and you're just trying to have them be there without doing compulsions. And then, of course, the OCD can jump in and say, well, because you're doing that, you may make them happen and just being like, well, maybe. But this mm -hmm. is what I'm going to do to get better. This is what I want to do because I really want a life of freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even though it's challenging, right? Because, and I think that's what, what she's kind of touching on with like battling the OCD, right? It feels more challenging to say maybe some of these other phrases with that are associated with ERP versus, you know, good vibes only or whatever um, type of idea is that you do want to recognize that it is going to be hard to battle the OCD, but how Shala was kind of talking about earlier, each option is difficult, right? Whether we choose to do a treatment or not, um, we're just looking for that long-term um, result, right? Which probably ERP, but I won't drop any hints. <laughs> yeah. And I think the other thing here is if you're trying to keep these thoughts from being there so that you don't manifest them, yes. You're going to make them worse. So I mm -hmm. think that's what we're talking about. It sounds like sort of bad options everywhere, right? But it's really, mm -hmm. again, about accepting the uncertainty that this is really not about the content. It's about not knowing whether what OCD is telling you is true. Um, and so just really keeping that in mind, too, that this is about really having a different relationship with anxiety and uncertainty, not about what OCD is saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm reading the book Brain Block. It's really good. Uh, have you read um, Dare, an OCD book? Have you read that one? Yes, Dare to Challenge OCD by Joan Davidson. Okay. I don't know if you want to touch on a little bit of, of the content of it. Sure. It's a fabulous book um, because it talks a lot about the obstacles to treatment and the obstacles that we face internally to treatment and how to overcome those and a really good step-by-step -step methodology for approaching ERP. So I highly recommend it. It's a great book. Cool. I figured that you would have read it after all the books that you, you've been sharing. So cool. Glad you were able to give a little synopsis. Um, okay. How do you stop checking? My OCD is the checking. 
Um, so, I mean, not in a patronizing way, we, we, we choose to stop the behavior, um, even though it's really hard, right? We're, we're, I'm sitting with the uncertainty. I don't know if the checking is around like doors or could be feelings or, or whatever it is, but I would encourage you to sit with whatever it is that, um, you might be fearing could happen in the results of not checking, or even it might be as simple as just the discomfort you, you feel when you don't check and, and sitting with that literal physical, um, discomfort, um, and recognizing that nothing lasts for forever. I think that's a really big reminder that I, that I tell my members is this discomfort will eventually subside. Your, your anxiety will eventually come down in the absence of having to do the compulsion. Um, so yeah, really, really learning to lean in to, to the discomfort of not checking. Mm -hmm. After fighting OCD for a few days at a special event or trip, I return home feeling a need to compulse a lot. How do I continue my success in not compulsing? Coming home, I let down my guard or fight. So a couple thoughts here, you know, it may be that after fighting OCD for a few days, when it's a special thing, it just feel exhausted. Mm -hmm. um, and so that sort of allows the compulsions to be there. But I think if you come home with the expectation that, okay, OCD is going to be putting its gloves on and wanting me to compulse. And I'm going to choose to the best of my ability not to do that. So really realizing that you're going to walk into a very challenging, triggering situation and having a plan for that mm -hmm. while being compassionate that you may be tired and it may be hard and you don't have to do it perfectly. But mm -hmm. I think that might help also looking at it and saying, okay, I'm going to come home and OCD is going to be triggering me and fabulous. This is a great opportunity to practice. I'm going to sock it to OCD again. Mm. Yeah. I love that. Like self-encouragement there. I think even pointing out that, you know, you, you went a few days and it sounds like you, you did a lot of, um, ERP, right. Resisting your compulsion. So like, Hey, like I did this, I got this, I can handle this. And um, even though it might feel harder or it might feel scarier, again, that's just one of those tricks that OCD is trying to convince, convince me of, right? Because I'm going to guess whether you were on the trip or at home, it wasn't necessarily inherently any more or less dangerous. It's just that feeling of it being more, more urgent or um, important, I guess. Um, I think the other thing too is um, I noticed if there's no like time limit that we're delaying compulsion. So I'll see this is really common. Like people will like resist, resist, resist. And then it's like almost like this explosion of uh, explosion is kind of an intense word, but it'll be like a lot of, a lot of compulsions will come out because they've been resisting for so long. Um, so if, if you want to try like maybe setting literally a timer, like um, I know that maybe you were trying not to do it because I'm guessing you are with people, but if you're alone setting a literal timer, like 10 minutes in 10 minutes, um, I, I can do my compulsion. But for these 10 minutes, I'm going to delay that compulsion. Um, and when the timer is up, you can kind of reassess, like maybe you decide after those 10 minutes, like I actually don't want to do my compulsion. Um, or maybe you decide that you want to, but you know, slowly incrementally increasing that time, um, you know, that you're, you're delaying the compulsion. <laughs> Duh, I have to show this one. Dr. McGrath is out tonight slaying OCD demons like a boss. Probably. <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> uh, okay. Is it important to do ERP every time OCD triggers or are there times doing a compulsion is okay? Ooh, I don't know how I would answer this initially. Do you, do you want to start off? Yeah. So unfortunately, OCD is pretty black and white. Like for OCD, it, it can be like we're either doing compulsions or we're not doing compulsions. And so if if you and I think there's variance, there's varying degrees of this. Right. And it depends on what part of therapy you're in. If you're all the way through therapy and you've really been through your whole list of 
triggers and fears and you're doing well, then giving yourself permission to do a compulsion can send you on the road to like having more compulsions and more obsessions. You know, if you're exhausted, if you're having a lot of stress in life, you know, and you need to give yourself permission to do a compulsion. Okay, you give yourself permission to do a compulsion. I think we just need to recognize it's a slippery road because mm -hmm. OCD is going to take that as, oh, great, we're doing compulsions again because it's really black and white. If you're in the middle of therapy, you may have a whole list of compulsions you're still doing because you're working on this list of compulsions over here. And so that's perfectly fine because you haven't gotten to those yet. So I think it's not a one size fits all answer, but it is important to know that you know, OCD to OCD, a compulsion is a compulsion. Even a little compulsion to OCD is like, ooh, we're doing compulsions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a good point. Um, you know, I do have a, a lot of people who will report like OCD will, will be like, just do one, just do it once. Like, um, like almost like this, like voice, like it, it'll feel better. And then it does. It, you know, winds up snowballing into um, a lot of a lot of compulsion sometimes. So definitely a slippery slope. Um, and I think, you know, my motto is perfection is not the goal, right? I think of even people who don't have OCD do compulsive like behavior or obsessive like behavior. The goal is that not that you never ruminate. Um, and it kind of reminds me or any other compulsion that you're doing. Um, but you know, that, that's not the goal. The goal is that, um, you know, you do, if you do happen to find yourself doing a compulsion, okay, like I recognize that, but I'm still going to move on with my day. Um, I'm not going to obsess over obsessing or, or making it perfect. Yes. I think that's a very important point. We never want to try to do OCD perfectly. So right. you know, even though it's, we want to try to diminish compulsions as much as we can, you can't perfectly get rid of them. Um, so I think that's a really important point to remember. So there's a lot of sort of nuance to dealing with this. It seems like, oh, this is really straightforward and, and black and white, but there's a lot of nuance and gray here. Um, yeah. Really what OCD is about is learning to live in all this gray and all this nuance. Yeah, yeah. Um, like I've mentioned before, I'm sure multiple times tonight is that OCD has so many tricks, and I can almost feel it even sometimes like wanting to pull me. I don't know if you get caught um, when you're with clients like, oh, gosh, like, I feel like I'm almost being pulled into the compulsion. <laughs> um, so yeah, definitely has a lot of tricks um, um, up its sleeve. Okay. Um, so this one has been put in a couple times. Can compulsive buying be related to OCD? Whenever I want something, I can't stop thinking about it until I buy it. What can I do? Um, well, I don't know. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Jenna, Jenna Overbaugh, but I'm going to use her line. I, I'm a hammer and everything I see is nails. Um, so although I might not deem it as OCD, I would... I would still say you could apply some ERP to it, right? It sounds like it feels really uncomfortable if you don't buy the, whatever it is. Um, and if you do buy it, it gives you that sense of relief um, and probably long-term discomfort. So I would I would encourage you to not buy um, and sit with that discomfort and, and watch it pass on its own. In the treatment of hoarding disorder, which is a disorder related to OCD, sometimes what we'll do is... Um, non-acquisition shopping trips where we go shopping, mm -hmm. but we don't buy anything, right? So we learn oh, to be in the presence of these things that we feel urges and triggers to, you know, call our own and buy and take home and learn to not do that. And so you can even make a hierarchy for this about the things that would be, you know, easy to say no to and medium, hard and hard. And you, you can start somewhere in that hierarchy and practice with this, like Medina was saying, so that you can can get used to being in that presence of that urge and being able to say no mm -hmm. while also being compassionate. This is going to be hard and you're not going to do it perfectly. You may come home with something and be like, oh, I messed up. Oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, advice for dealing with physical symptoms of anxiety. Sitting with anxiety can be more challenging with physical symptoms. Yeah, it can, it can definitely cause a lot of stress. Um, I would say like, so many people, no matter what subtype they're coming in with, report physical symptoms just to normalize it a bit. 
Um, I treat it very similarly. Uh, I use what we call enteroceptives, and I'm sure Shala does too. Mm -hmm. uh, we're essentially re-evoking some of these physical sensations that are, are really uncomfortable. And, and really the key caveat here is that we're choosing not to assign meaning um, or choosing not to try to get rid of that physical sensation. And really um, leaning into this idea that we live in noisy bodies. Like, um, I, I usually go as far to say, like, if you didn't have any physical sensations, anxiety would latch onto that too. Like, what does that mean? Um, so, so really leaning into some of those sensations without trying to get rid of them. Okay. Never had harm intrusive thoughts, but ever since they came into my mind or felt as urges, they've made me scared of why they started as if I really want them. What are some skills to battle this? So I think again what ocd does is say, says why am i having this what is my intention for having this does this does having it mean that i want it that i'm going to do it and i think really learning to do the erp for this which is to go be in the presence of triggers that cause these intrusive thoughts and learning to be with the anxiety and the thoughts that those cause and this is where i use a lot of scripting so if i have somebody go and like say it's because they're going to be near the kitchen where kitchen knives are it's going to be near their children you know so they can go be in the presence and if they're not in the presence of somebody else they can do the scripting but you know like well i don't i'm having these thoughts and it may or may not mean that i'm a serial killer and i just don't know it and you know i may or may not really want to do this and the fact that i'm you know standing here doing the script may or may not really mean i'm a murderer and so really being in the presence of those thoughts um and trying to accept the uncertainty that we don't know why they're there and we'll never know why they're there and that's why ocd is latching on to it Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I always I always say the reason because a lot of people ask me, like, why do I have this thought, Medina? Like, why this thought? And you're having this thought because you want so badly and to not have this thought. Um, and I also like not as a not as a form of reassurance, but um, just some psycho ed in the sense of um, a lot of worries are based off people's values. Like you can, for the most part, tell what a person values if you simply ask them what they're worried about. Um, and so if you can even like reframe that a little bit, I know that's more of like cognitive stuff, um, but pairing it with the behavioral aspect might be helpful too. Um, you know, one more recess on this. Um, yeah. John Hirschfield's book about harm OCD um, is really good. But, and the full title is eluding me for some reason, maybe because it's almost nine o'clock at night. Overcoming, <laughs> overcoming Harm OCD. Just look at Harm OCD and John Hirschfield. It's a blue book. Um, it's fabulous on this. So if you have Harm OCD, I highly, highly recommend it. Yeah, good recommendation. Um, do you have Do you have time? We can do a few more for the people. Okay. Um, <laughs> How do you get comfortable and overcome contamination, OCD? Um, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge that question, comfortable, because um, <laughs> I don't know if that's the exact goal. I think, uh, incidentally, it does happen sometimes when we do ERP. We do become more comfortable, or or we learn that we can handle it, which in turn can often make us feel more comfortable. Um, but as I kind of mentioned earlier. For me, the goal is never to get my members um, to feel comfortable per se, but just to teach them that they can sometimes feel comfortable, but they can also manage feeling uncomfortable. So I think that would be like my first um, recommendation, I guess, um, is to maybe reframe that that word a little bit. Yeah, because I think what we want to do is we want to change the goal. Like you said, like the goal is to go be uncomfortable mm -hmm. on purpose because that's how you get your life back. And there is a great um, TED talk called The Gift and Power of Emotional Courage, I believe, by Susan David. And a quote from there is just so good. It says, discomfort is the price of admission to a meaningful life. Okay. And I think that's what we're talking about here is if we stay comfortable, we have a small contained life that OCD is running. Mm -hmm. If we choose discomfort on purpose, 
that's how we get our values. That's how we get meaning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just again, pointing out the fallacies and the logic that OCD has presented, like do this so you can avoid feeling uncomfortable, but you're, you're sitting here with me for a reason. Like you feel very uncomfortable. And so OCD has lied and has, has not achieved the goal that it said it was going to achieve for you. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, kind of either way, recognizing that life is embedded with uncomfortable situations and that doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. Okay, let's do, ah, I don't know how to pick from the last ones. Um, we would we would be here till like midnight, Shala. I don't know. I don't know about you, but I'm usually in bed by now. <laughs> yeah, I really won't remember names of books that had. <laughs> um, okay, let's do this one. This one isn't really a question, but I think it's important. Mental checking, because um, I think I, I personally think it's so common, no matter what the subtype. Um, so like mental rumination or what I deem as like trying to figure something out or problem solve, I think can consume a lot of time um, for a lot of people with OCD and, and make them feel like they're being productive. And again, a big thing that I notice is not wanting to feel negligent. I don't know if you see that often, like, oh, if I worry about it, that means I'm less negligent of a person or, um, you know, when people stop worrying about it. Oh my God, Medina, what does that mean? Does that mean I actually want to do it? Um, so again, you know, a lot of helpful things to do with mental checking or, or rumination or mental review is, is to choose to pivot, right? So remembering that um, the initial thought, the intrusive thought that pops in, that thought that just kind of comes into your head, that's not something we have control over, but all that effort or the conjuring up of the information regarding the thought that is what we're working on trying to, to eliminate or to stop to the best of our ability. Because um, I, I think for a lot of people, it can get really confusing. Like, Medina, you just said, don't control my thoughts, but then you're telling me to not ruminate. Um, but the two are different, right? So the initial intrusive thought we let come in, and then we're sitting with that uncertainty. You're like, what if I'm a pedophile? That will pop in. There's a chance I'm a pedophile versus, well, I did think that girl was really, that little girl was really cute. And, you know, maybe I felt something down in my groin region and, you know, I, I was, my heart was beating. So maybe that meant something. Um, so working on um, addressing some of those things might be helpful, even though this wasn't a question, but. <laughs> Yeah, and I have some blogs on my website that might be helpful for cool. them. You just go to shalanicely.com and you search for interrupting mental rituals. You'll find two pretty extensive blog posts on some techniques to help with this. Cool. All right. One more. Let's do one more. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to see if there's a lot of people saying thanks. Um, <laughs> okay, let's do this one. I find DBT distress tolerance to be helpful on a daily basis, but DBT methods incorporate a lot of distraction. Is it possible to do ERP and DBT? Do you want me to take that one? Sure. So DBT is a great adjunct to ERP. And I think if we use distress tolerance skills to be able to stay in exposures, that's great because that's really what we're looking to do. I think that we have to remember that the goal in ERP is to be uncomfortable and anxious on purpose, whereas some of the goals in DBT is to regulate, downregulate some of the emotions. And so I think as long as you can remember that in exposures, what we're trying to do is stay with the tough emotions. And if you can use your DBT skills to allow you to stay in there, which I think you can, mm -hmm. then I think it's great. I think that if you found ERP too hard because emotions were too overwhelming, then DBT is a great thing to add on so that you can stay with the emotions and stay in the exposure. So I think as long as you're using D DBT to help you achieve your ERP goals, then I think it's absolutely great. 
Yeah. And I think it goes, it goes back to what you kind of touched on earlier, as far as the intention behind using some of these skills. Um, you know, if you are again, using it as a way to escape, um, uh, making sure we're kind of reassessing that. Cause there is, there is a lot of cool, helpful DBT skills, um, but, um, not as a way to get away from the discomfort. So. All right, everyone. Thank you for coming and hanging out with us. And I really want to thank Shala. Um, it was so cool to like learn from you. I know you and I have never met. Um, so to just hear some of um, not only your contribu contributions to the field in general, but to just get to talk to you for a little bit was so cool. So thank you for joining us. Well, thank you. Likewise, I really enjoyed being here with you as well. Yeah. And um, as always, um, remember that you can log on, log on. You can go on to our website, Tree My OCD. You can get a free 15 minute phone consultation if you are uh, wondering if you have OCD or you want to get an assessment. Um, and yeah, I'm sure I will see you guys soon. And I hope everyone has a great night. Take care. Bye.